Paint splatters on screen revealing a series of images, a woman playing violin, then in a bright pink costume, then in a blind skier pinning atop a mountain. The paint drip splatters revealing text in print and braille, unsightly opinions. Hi, welcome to Unsightly Opinions. My name is Tamara. Today we are going to explore how we travel with a service dog, with a guide dog, both domestically and internationally. You may notice that the background behind me is a little bit different and that is because I am in a hotel room in a completely different country with patients. So I want to talk about some of the things that you need to bring with you, some of the different things that you need to consider when you're traveling with your guide dog, and then I'm going to take you on the road with me so I can show you how it all works in the real world. The method of travel is going to dictate how you travel with your guide dog. So if you're in a car, it's going to be a lot easier than if you're going on a plane or on a train or somewhere where they really limit what you can take with you. I carry quite a number of things with me to keep my guide dog safe and healthy. First and foremost, I have her harness and leash and I always carry a spare leash just in case something happens to her work leash. I carry one roll of poop bags per week. Is she necessarily going to go through an entire roll of poop bags in a week? No. Definitely not, but that way I can disseminate it between bags and purses and everything else I'm carrying while I'm away. I bring whatever outerwear she might need, whether it's a jacket, booties, depending on the weather we might encounter. I've got a raincoat here and I have a warmer jacket for her that I put her in on the plane because the floor of the plane can get really, really cold and most of my guide dogs, even though they're used to the harsh Canadian winters, do end up shivering. I carry her food with me. I will bring extra food because I never want to run short for any reason. Usually my rule of thumb is for every week you're away, bring an extra full 24 hours worth of food. I will always have a full day that way if the luggage gets lost, if something happens, it gives me time to find food for her, to find something on the other end. Even though it's going to be a hassle, she's not going to starve. Do not check your food if you can help it. It's going to help with customs and immigration so that they can see what the food is. I keep her on a dog kibble because that's a lot easier to import than a raw food diet. I also keep her scoops in her food bag just so that all stays together. And I bring a collapsible. There's lots of different kinds. This one's silicone. It has a loop at one end so I can hook it to luggage or to a carry-on or to whatever. Usually I just slip it in the side pocket of a bag. It collapses really nice and small. It's a lot easier than taking a heavy metal or ceramic bowl and a lot easier to take with you when you're out for the day. And then I will bring her toys. Patience is not really a big toy dog, so she likes her Nyla bones, so I bring that with her so she can have something to do when we have downtime in the hotel room. If she likes to chew after dinner, which is her usual go-to, I will have something for her to do so she can let off some steam because she's going to be working typically a little bit more than what we'd see on an average day-to-day -day at home, so it's nice to give her the opportunity to do what she likes. Now you're probably wondering, what do I do in terms of a dog bed? It's very, very difficult to pack a full lab-sized dog bed on a plane. There's a few things that will happen depending on the situation. I don't like her sleeping on the ground because I want her joints to be supported, I want her to be comfortable. What I will do, and I've done this with all of my guide dogs, is depending on the hotel, if it's a pet-friendly hotel, sometimes they've provided dog beds for us. That's been amazing. When we get into the room is I'll try and find something, a cushion, a pillow, extra blankets, something that I can put on the floor for her so she can be comfortable. In this case, we use the cushion that I'm sitting on in this chair and she could curl up on that. It was perfect. And I also bring a lint roller so that when we're done, I can just quickly lint roller off the chair and nobody's going to know that a dog was on it. I have also, when extra stuff has not been available, asked for extra blankets or extra pillows, and everyone's been more than accommodating. If you're using pillows or blankets, I usually try and put a towel over top or something else. So again, you're not getting a lot of dog fur on something someone's gonna put their head on. Also your destination, whether it's domestic or international, is going to strongly dictate what you need to have with you so that your guide dog can actually get in. In this case, I'm traveling between the United States and Canada, so I need to have some very specific documentation. Every single country you visit is going to be different, and some countries are going to be easier or harder to get into with your service animal. Note that many countries have different regulations for service animals versus pets, so you wanna make sure you're looking at the correct regulations, and the ones for pets are usually a little bit harsher than the ones for service dogs or guide dogs. For example, a couple of years ago, I went with patients to the United Kingdom. 
even though it's part of the EU, it had very specific regulations in place, which I had to follow to the letter, including a veterinary inspection when we landed in the UK, in addition to documentations of all her vaccinations, special deworming medication, and a veterinary certificate of inspection. Other EU countries are not nearly that strict, so be sure to read very carefully. And if you're not sure, call the embassy and be sure to message the agricultural or livestock section of the government for the country that you're going to be visiting because they will have the information that is most up to date. Do not rely on your average Google search because that information can change yearly and sometimes even monthly. One of my pro tips is don't pull your documents out at the airport unless they ask for them. More often than not, they will not ask for your documents and it's gonna save a bunch of time if you don't have to pull everything out and they have to look through all the vaccine records. Travel between Canada and the US is relatively straightforward and I keep more than I'm required to carry with me just so that people know what's going on. Aside from my passport, I take my veterinary certificate of inspection which says that my guide dog here is free of any communicable diseases to other animals that she might encounter here while she's staying in the States. I carry her vaccination records. I carry her entire health history. I carry proof that she is in fact a registered service animal, which is not strictly necessary under the ADA, but is required by my airline. And I carry any superfluous documents that might be important like her space certificate and a letter from my guide dog school acknowledging that we are a registered team. I have to get all of these documents in place less than seven days before I travel, and that can vary slightly depending on where you're traveling in the US. Here in New York, it was 30 days, but my airline, again, separate regulations, required seven days before travel. So I keep everything in a folder, that way it's all safe, and I keep photos of all of these documents on my phone just in case these get lost. There are special schemes like pet passports and other things that you can get if you travel a lot, but I find those are oftentimes more work than they're worth. You're still gonna have to jump through a bunch of hoops essentially to get your guide dog where you wanna go. There is an added expense, whether you want to or not, to have all of this stuff filled out so that you can travel with your guide dog because your vet is probably going to charge you for forms. You may need special certification from the agricultural department, which I have had to get on numerous occasions when I've been traveling to Europe with my guide dog. And there's going to be added expense because you're going to have to travel to a bunch of different places to get all of the documentation in order before you go. When it comes to booking flights and booking hotels, you are going to want to check both your airline and your hotel's regulations regarding service animals. And even with Airbnb, they do have a policy regarding service animals. When it comes to booking hotels, I will usually leave a note in the special requests or special accommodations area to say that I am traveling with a service dog or I'm traveling with whatever mobility tools I'm using. And sometimes that will allow you to be put in the accessible room, which has more floor space and sometimes is a little bit easier to navigate to because it's on the first floor or very close to the front desk. They may have extra documentation that they want you to sign, which says if the guide dog destroys the room or your service dog does damage, you're responsible for that. They want your service animal to stay in harness anytime they're leaving the room, etc., etc. Usually it's fairly reasonable, but if you have any questions or any concerns, you can always ask to speak to a manager. When I checked in here, they did not have an accessible form, so somebody had to read it to me, which again, I never feel good about signing something that somebody's reading. I never know if they're reading everything. You are allowed to stay in any Airbnb, whether the owner says you can or not. Usually I will be a little more accommodating. I will make sure that the owner or the host does not have allergies because again, I do not want to force my dog into someone's home who would have a medical reaction to that. That's not fair. I use a guide dog for medical reasons. I don't want to cause anyone else medical problems just because I want to stay somewhere. Hotels do have a duty to accommodate, so even if somebody in the hotel has an allergy, you're still allowed to stay because they can just put you somewhere else far away from that person that might have allergies. And I'm sure you're wondering, what do I do with my guide dog when I come to the pool or spa facilities in a hotel? It's really easy. She's allowed to accompany me into the spa area. She's allowed to accompany me to the pool, but obviously don't take your dog into the sauna, hot tub, or into the pool. That's not a safe place for them. So what I do is she's always within visual range where I am. I usually don't go to the pool alone, but I can do that if I want to. And what I'll do is, if I'm alone, I'll bring my white cane so I can find the edge of the pool safely. And 
and try and find the corner of the pool so I can identify where to get out later. But if I have somebody with me, obviously she's going to be within visual range of where they are the entire time we're in the pool. And what I'm going to do is I usually grab a pool towel or a room towel. I'll toss it down on the floor so she knows where her spot is, usually right beside wherever I put my stuff. And I'll tell her, okay, pull it down. And she'll know that that's her spot. It's nice, clean, dry, and comfortable, so she's happy as a clam. And then I'll just hook her leash under a chair leg, or over the arm of my wheelchair, or wherever is most convenient so that she's tethered in place. That's basically it. And she'll just camp out there as long as I'm in the pool, and then I'll just retrieve her when I'm done. And when we get back to the room after a long day, perfectly well-behaved guide dog. Perfectly well-behaved guide dog. Go! I let her be a dog. She's allowed. Yep. She doesn't have to work in the room. You're... She just gets to hang out and be happy. She doesn't have the hunger. When you're booking flights, there are a lot of policies and a lot of red tape you're going to have to go through. Certain airlines have special phone numbers that you need to call, special people you need to talk to to confirm that your dog is in fact a service animal. They've been cracking down in recent years with the emotional support animals, so they are going to want a lot of documentation. They're going to want to know the size of your dog, they're going to want to know where your dog is coming from, where your dog was trained, what your dog's tasks are, their height, their weight, their breed, and then they're going to make a determination on a couple of things. Most airlines that I have traveled on are incredibly accommodating and will try and put you in bulk head seating, which is fantastic because your dog is not gonna tuck under the seat and get kicked in the face by somebody in front or get a bag dropped on them. It's a lot more efficient to travel in the bulkhead row because it's easier for you to get on and off the plane if you have mobility challenges and it's more space for the dog. Sometimes that's not possible on small planes because the bulkhead row is the emergency exit, which they don't let anyone with a service dog sit in because of the possible challenges that might arise if you were evacuating the plane. Oftentimes, they will also give you an additional seat next to you for your dog, not to sit in, but the floor space, so your dog has enough space to spread out. Depending on the size of your dog, it's going to say a lot about whether they're gonna give you that extra seat or not. With the way airlines have been going in recent years, I have run into difficulties where my previous dog, who was closer to 100 pounds, would not fit in the row wearing his harness. So they did have to find additional seating for me on the plane, closer to the front, and it all worked out. But keep in mind that you're probably not going to be as comfortable as you would if you did not have a guide dog or service dog sitting on your feet for however long your flight is going to be. Your dog must stay in harness and must stay on the floor the entire time you are on the plane. The dog isn't allowed up on the seat, isn't allowed up on your lap, unless they are performing a task for you for medical reasons. Many airports will also have dog relief areas, although they can be challenging to get to, so you may want to ask for directions, especially if you're blind or low vision, because they can be tucked away in little corners. But most major airports will have one or more pet relief areas through security that you can access, which is fantastic because 10 years ago that wasn't a thing. And let me tell you, running through airports on connections trying to take your dog out is not fun, especially when you have to go through security multiple times out and in to just relieve your dog. If you're extra concerned because it's a super long haul flight and you're not sure your dog is going to make it outside or to the pet relief area, you can always use a doggy diaper just in case. It's not a big deal and most dogs aren't super thrilled about wearing it, but it's a lot easier to deal with a messy diaper than an accident on the floor of the airport, especially when you've been on a plane for six, 12, 14 hours. I will also usually try and limit the water intake of my dog for the day leading up to the flight, if the flight is more than a couple of hours, just again, so that she isn't uncomfortable for the entire flight, especially because airports are huge, there's a lot of walking, and there's a lot of distance between where you get off the plane and where you're going to find outside or a pet relief area. 
going through security screening can be a little bit of a challenge and you have to know your rights and what the rules are for where you are being screened. Where I am in North America, you are not supposed to be separated from your dog. Even though that's the rule and that's the law, I can tell you that on more than a few occasions, I've had security people say, oh, just hand me your dog and she'll go through. And I say, no, you do not separate a guide dog user or a service dog user from their handler. They are supposed to stay attached to you at all times. There is going to be extra screening if your dog's harness or your dog's vest or whatever you're using has metal on it. Most dog's collars and other things will have metal on them. So you can expect to go through what I like to call the full meal deal. Usually I will walk or roll through depending on the situation with patients at my side. Sometimes a security person will reach their hand through to help guide me through the gate so I don't bump into it. And when you have a service dog or you have other mobility tools that are going to prevent you from going through, you do not go through the big x-ray machine. Because you don't do that, there will be additional screening methods that they will use, whether it's a pat down, they may search your bags, they may swab your hands for any residues of gunpowder or drugs. They may also visually inspect your dog. They are not allowed to touch or interact with your dog, but they can ask you to make your dog stand, sit, or lay down as they see fit. Usually I will try and be as polite and cooperative as possible. I understand that they are just doing their job. This is what they're trained and supposed to do. And so long as they aren't asking me to do something really unreasonable, I will acquiesce to whatever they are asking for. Off to the airport. Patience walks beside Tamara in the airport. We are now situated on the plane. I was not able to film anything through security because it's security. But this is how it all works on the plane. Patience is at my feet. And you see how we're in full pants and we've got a jacket on. It's all comfy. Let's see. It actually gives me enough room to actually put my feet on the floor. It makes a huge difference for comfort when you're on a multi-hour flight. Allowing your dog to be able to stretch out and lay comfortably because this would not happen in a regular row. So thank you WestJet, they're awesome. They put us in premium. Looking out the window of the plane as it takes off over the ocean. I'm so excited. I don't know if you know this, but I have a lot of allergies and it's really difficult for me to find food on planes, but this flight, they actually had something I could eat. I couldn't eat the full meal, but they were able to make some modifications and I'm really, really happy about it. So I'm going to try and show you here. Robbie's going to help me line up the camera. Can you see it? Okay. So we have some mashed yams and some salad and they have these really adorable salt and pepper shakers that make it really easy. I mean, I'd like if they were tactile, that would help, but they're really cute. Anyways, I'm gonna enjoy my meal. Beishi's still hanging out on the floor. Say hi, Beishi. Okay. And if you're on a WestJet plane, correction, they are tactilely different. The pepper is a triangle shape and the salt is an arrow shape, so it has an indent on one of the triangles. Okay, so I don't know how long this has been a thing. I think it's very recent, but we just went on a WestJet app and they have audio description as one of the options. Robin found it for me. I'm so excited. I'm going to watch a movie now. Landing in Canada at night. How you've arrived, patient. How do you feel? Oh, yes, I love you too. I love you too. Okay, now we have the long wait. We're the last ones off the plane. And my phone died while I was filming the outro for this video, so instead I'm going to leave you with this wonderful clip of Patience having a good snuggle with all of her bones. It's the first thing she did when she got into the house because she missed them so dearly. Anyways, that's all I have for you in this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, don't be afraid to leave them down below, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye for now.